I mentioned earlier that the police are very good at arresting drug dealers. Hmm. Does that therefore mean that the mafia or the cartel ultimately are perfectly designed to maintain and monopolize the drug business? Because all the low level people just get wiped out, but something that's got the infrastructure of a cartel can just keep going. Well, yeah, absolutely. But I wouldn't even say that it's the infrastructure of the cartel maintains it because it's it's simpler than that, really. It, because it doesn't matter what level it is, whether it's the lowest street dealer, middle management, regional dealer, or even a whole cartel. If you arrest them, if you stop them, all you do is create an opportunity for somebody else, whether that's another cartel at the top, another street dealer at the bottom. So police are fantastic at catching drug dealers. And sometimes, sometimes, occasionally, they'll even catch some high up people, sometimes. Uh, but they don't reduce the size of the market. But they do change the shape of the market. And over time, that changing shape that's caused by policing um, has got more brutal and uglier. So after this situation with the burger bar, Boys, did you go back to wearing the wire? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, I didn't report the search because I didn't want the job to be pulled. And uh, that's something I learned quite on earlier on with uh, undercover work. Sometimes with the complicity of my handler or sometimes with the complicity of an investigating team member. You know, the first time I saw a gun, actually in Derby, did, I started writing it up on my notes and the, the, the DC said, well, you can write that up if you want. You can pull that in, yeah. But we're not going to find the gun, are we? Unless we go looking for it now. And do you think we'll find it now? Right. And when we do, and we haven't got any evidence, and we haven't got any evidence of dealing, what do you think will happen? So then the penny dropped. I had to just keep going and not report. You report it, the job gets pulled. But if you keep going, you get evidence. So, so even the mechanisms of how this is investigated from the police point of view, I was breaking the rules. I was breaking the rules so many times. I was doing it for noble with noble intent, but the rules being broken in order to try and catch people. I even I even AP'd somebody once, uh, which means agent provocateur, which is the absolute no no, the absolute golden rule of undercover work. You do not um, use an agent provocateur technique. But this guy, sorry to go off on a no, you're sorry. fine. You've got we've got all the time. You just keep expand. Um, this um, th this guy in dark. It, well, was it Derby, Leicestershire? This guy in Leicestershire was burglaring houses uh, of old women. He was also an amphetamine dealer. They couldn't catch him, but they had clear intelligence that this guy was going into old women's bedrooms to, to steal from them, and it was terrifying them. So they couldn't catch him for the burglaries, but they thought, well, let's see if we can get him for the dealing. So I went in, and he was only a pisspot dealer, really. But I talked him up because he was an obnoxious and foul creature. He really was. I talked him into, I was saying, look, mate of mine's just been let down on a kilo, uh, some coke um, and other stuff. And um, I talked him into, he was saying, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can, I can do it. But it was beyond his capabilities. It was, and I was quite sure it was. So when we raided him, we got this kilo that was, that was like 0.5% pure. He just got an ounce or something and like bashed it down. <laughs> Yeah, I'm capable of a kilo, you know. But so, so there he was in court for for this trying to sell a kilo, and that's not actually the reality. And he never was capable of it. So really, I'd I'd AP'd him, I'd I'd, I'd uh, enticed him into committing an offence that he wouldn't have otherwise have committed, or a more serious offence, which is wrong. You know, it is wrong. Uh, it's in the basic instructions for undercover work that you don't do that. But. Um, but you believe that was for the greater good because of what he was doing. Yeah, you call it noble corruption. But, you know, if, if I was still in the job, I could be sacked for admitting that. So where is the line drawn in this country then between the quantity of drugs you're arrested with and the purity? Well, a good solicitor might have sorted that out and got him to, to make an issue of it. But he pleaded guilty. And, and um, that would appear... I don't know the discussions that went on between him and his solicitor, but that would appear to be very poor advice, really, because um, because if he'd just taken a bit to look at it or understand, you know, a solicitor maybe didn't, maybe didn't understand that that was utterly ridiculous, because that's not a kilo, is it? It's not a kilo; it's an ounce at best, you know. So um, yeah, at best. So it's just the way the legal system often works. And. Do the police sometimes 
established themselves as undercover sellers. And what's the purity of the drugs they would use in that case? No, you never get any, never, not in this country. I know they have some weird ways of doing stuff in America that confuses the hell out of me. But no, no, you, you never, never pose as sellers. I mean, I pretended to be a mid-level dealer when I was buying to say I was going to be then selling it on elsewhere plenty of times. Um, but you don't supply. You never, supply is always supply. Supply is always unlawful. I see. Okay. Okay. So going back to the burger bar then, you're back. You've got your wire back on now. How are your interactions with them now? Completely back to normal. They were absolutely fine and, and a bit cheeky actually. Um, like, like they were happier with me. So so one day I'd, I'd phone up and say, uh, it'd be my second buy in the day. And I said, yeah, can you do us one-on-one? -on -one? And they'd go, uh, oh, you're such a bad boy. Yeah, yeah, man, you can have one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, and right, quite, quite friendly with me then. It was a bit strange. And then a few days after that, or a couple of weeks afterwards, I remember getting in the car because they generally, one would be driving in the front or two in the front and driving someone in the back and you'd get into the back and the guy at the back would serve you up. So I got in this big car with them one day and this absolute fug of ganj smoke, fug of weed smoke came out of the car. It's like, Jesus Christ, it's some kind of weird hot box or something. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> They were no, They normally were really sharp and dead professional and they didn't use any drugs at all. But this day, they obviously decided to get absolutely caned. I mean, I went I went, I went in, sat next to him, and he's looking at me like through almost closed <laughs> eyes. And he looks at me. because, And weirdly for this operation, almost, almost as a sort of um, a weird bolstering of my own courage somehow that I decided to use a cover name similar to my own. And this was a reaction to how close the corruption was in the previous job, if you know what I mean. It was me taking the like taking the piss out of the system that, well, if I've got undercover cops on my backup team, potentially. It was my sense of humor at the time. But anyway, I was for that job operation, I was being known as Woody. So I get in the back of this car and he's looking at me with the eyes closed, and he's looking at me and saying, Woody man, why they call you Woody man? Is it because you looks like Woody Allen, man? I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't have said so, but I'm thinking... So I came out with this bizarre story, which <laughs> I just sometimes you just go thinking on your feet and go with it. And I says, well, no, actually, it's it's because of what... When I was younger, some, some of my mates used to call me. Um, see, I had skin cancer on my head just there, and it was, and I had to have it lasered off. And I said, you can probably still see the scar. And he went, oh, yeah. So I said, uh, yeah, so it's, it, you know, I don't know if the scar's gone, but maybe it's a bit there, but I had to have it lasered on my head. Now, do you remember the to the film Toy Story, I said? And he went, oh, yeah, yeah. Obviously a Toy Story fan. Um, I says, well, do you remember when the naughty kid picks up Woody and he burns his head with a magnifying glass? And he went, yeah, yeah. I says, well, I had my skin cancer at the time that Toy Story was out. So my mates saw that and found it funny and took the piss out of me and they called me Woody because of the skin cancer and it's stuck ever since. <laughs> and this seven times murderer gangster from Birmingham looked at me and went, oh man, that's so mean. <laughs> <laughs> Which just goes to show really, you know, perhaps when he was 14, 15, he didn't think he'd grow up to be a murdering gangster and it actually had some humanity behind all of that when you say seven times murder then what yeah. do you mean by that the intelligence said he was implicated in seven murders in Birmingham. seven murders mm. and you said earlier that they protect you against that information so when you're going in oh did, earlier did you know, on did you know that on this I, case i know all of i knew all of their intel for this one I, I, see. I, I wanted to know and the ruling was that i could know yeah and do you know anything about the murders that he'd committed I don't know. I mean, some of them were rival connected with the Johnson crew. I do know that. It was part of their war. Who were the Johnson crew? Johnson crew were a rival a rival gang that they were at war with for a long time. Um, and another uber-aggressive um, uh, gang in Birmingham. I think the John, the name Johnson crew come, comes from Johnson Close, where some of them, some of them lived. So it was um, very much a postcode kind of 
gang culture really um loyalties and regional sort of territory so the burger bar boys have accepted you back in the crew now and they're acting cocky with you you said that you actually called them on one of the occasions and, and discussed the whatever it was, the deal. Are you obtaining wiretap phone call information as well as recording them on your little camera? Because my case, it was all wiretaps was the main evidence. Uh, I did do some recordings, uh, but again, the tech wasn't brilliant. The, the tech for the video was actually incredible for this one. I, I had, it, they had the unusually really high quality it's called an eagle and it's a tiny box and for the time it was brilliant tiny box and a wire and the camera and sound was the end of a wire it was really it's amazing so you're filming them there's actually a, a, a lens pointing at the person yeah yeah so how come that doesn't like twinkle or something the lens they can't it was see tiny it. it's so small it's remarkable really yeah it's small. Like yeah yeah still see and the, the mic's on the same point as well right yeah that and that was um so it was a little metal box that had to be downloaded. It was it was remarkable. Yeah. But the recording the phone calls was done on um, not a wire, not a uh, what you would call a facility in the UK. Uh, it would just use the donut. It's called a donut, and it would just be attached to the phone, and then in a donut shape, and then to a, re a basic recording device. Mm. So then you go through the procedure of r exhibiting that recording before you did it, and then did it. Mm -hmm. Tricky thing to do on plot. So it'd be like, I'd, I'd do it, um, get one of the backup team to get do it on a vehicle or something and then drop me off or something like that. Um, I didn't do that many recordings of the phone conversations, I don't think. So what is the criteria for the amount of evidence you need on the Burger Bar Boys before your job is done? Um, well, the main thing, intent and the main thing for those and those kind of operations is to get evidence of conspiracy. Uh, because that is can be stronger in court and it can also look, mean bigger sentences. And also it helps with evidence of other peripheral people involved as well. So it would be conversations, um, evidence of phone number, you know, phone data, that kind of thing. And building a picture over time of their movements and the communications between them. Um, so you take time to build up a picture, and, but... I mean, quite often you could see it in simple terms that, well, you've got enough evidence against somebody if you've got three corroborated buys individually or three corroborated instances of offences. But I was getting 20, 30 instances off some of them because it was about building up the bigger picture. Because also, I, you know, I would be connected and, and uh, buying off other people connected to them as well. I was where it was safe to do so. I was networking in a, in a broader sense. And by the end of the operation, there was a couple of other people involved as well, but there were 96 people in Northampton roped up into the, into the evidence of that whole operation. 96. It's not that big a place, Northampton. But after seven months, the criteria really for deciding that the job was over, that there was no one else to find. There was no other dealers to get to know, no other connected people, no other runners, no phone numbers to get. Everybody involved in that trade in Northampton we'd got in the bag. We thought we're going to wipe out the trade overnight. We've got so many people. Um, and it was a massive, expensive operation, actually. They got help from five. There were five constabularies cops. They got help from all the surrounding areas. Massive raids, all the burger bars boys, boys caught. So many other people locked up. Anyway, I had a phone call with the intel guy that we called two weeks later. And he says, yeah, Woody, um, we've managed to interrupt the heroin and crack cocaine supply in Northampton for a full two hours. Two hours. Two hours before there was another phone number on the streets and everyone knew where to go. Two hours. Now, that's not even enough time to rattle. That's not even enough time to rattle because you'd need four hours for that from heroin. But you can imagine the scene though, can't you? I don't know this for certain, but you can imagine the Johnson crew hearing that the burgers have been raided in Northampton and they'd be laughing, thinking, yeah, fantastic. Put the call in. Get an extra load of stuff in now. You know, we're going to make a killing. We'll take over that market. We're we'll du doubling our profit overnight. Thank you, the police. <laughs> That's exactly how I felt when Sammy the Bull, he got arrested a year or two before me. I was like, the police have just done me a favour. I could take all his customers now. <laughs>